but they did not find them. Yeah, you're on call back there. I don't know what's going on. Uh, when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come and let us return, or else my father will cease to be concerned about the donkeys, and he'll become anxious for us. The servant said to Saul, Behold, now there's a man of God in this city, and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which we have set out. That's Samuel. Verse 7, Then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is gone from our sack, and there's no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have in my hand a fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God, and he will take, tell us our way. And now this parenthetical note. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he used to say, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is called a prophet now used to be called a seer, a prophet, man of God, different terms for the same name. Verse 10. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said. Come, let's go. So they went to the city where the man of God, Samuel, was. And they went up the slope to the city. They found young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered them and said, He is. See, he's ahead of you. Hurry now, for he has come into the city today, for the people have a sacrifice on the high place today. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now therefore, go up, for you will find him at once, or if you hurry. So they went up into the city, and as they came into the city, behold, Samuel was coming out toward them to go up to the high place. Verse 15. Now a day before Samuel's, Saul's coming, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, saying, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. And he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have regarded my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, Behold, that's the man whom I spoke to you about. This one shall rule over my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And in the morning I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is on your mind. <laughs> this thing's got... Pray for the computer today, I guess. Dun, dun, dun. One more. There we go. Verse 20. As for your donkeys, which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's household? Saul replied, Am I not a Benjamite? of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me in this way? And Samuel took Saul and his servant, and brought them to the hall, and gave them a place at the head of those who were invited, who were about 30 men. Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion that I gave you, concerning which I said to you, set it aside. And the cook took up the leg with what was on it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here has what has been reserved, set it before you and eat, because it has been kept for you until the appointed time, since I said I have invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. Verse 25, when they came down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the roof, and they rose early, and at daybreak Samuel called to Saul on the roof, saying, Get up, that I may send you away. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. And as they were going down to the edge of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell your servant to go on ahead of us, but you remain standing with me now, that I may proclaim the word of God to you. Chapter 10. Then Saul took the flask of oil and poured it on 
Uh, Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you go from me today, then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza, and they will say to you, The donkeys which you went to look for have been found. Now behold, your father has ceased to be concerned about what the, don- about the donkeys, and he's anxious for you. And they'll say, your dad's been saying, what shall I do about my son? Verse 3, then you'll go on further from there and you'll come as far as the oak of Tabor. And there, three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you. One will have three young goats. Another will have three loaves of bread. Another will be carrying a jug of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from their hand. And afterward, you'll come to the hill where the Philistine garrison is, and it shall be as soon as you have come up there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place there. They'll have a harp, a tambourine, a flute, and a lyre with them, and they'll be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, Saul, mightily, and you will prophesy with them and be changed into another man. Verse 7 It shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires, for God is with you. And you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. And it happened when Saul turned his back to leave Samuel, God changed his heart and all those signs came about on that day. When they came to the hill there, behold, a group of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him mightily so that he prophesied among them. It came about when all who knew Saul previously saw that he had prophesied, now with the prophets, that the people said to one another, what has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man there said, now who is their father? Isn't it Kish? Like before, therefore, it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Now, Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where have you guys been? And Saul said, To look for the donkeys. When we saw that they could not be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But he did not tell his uncle about the matter of the kingdom, which Samuel had mentioned. Okay, there is our passage for today. You ever seen the movie When Harry Met Sally? Because I haven't. I really haven't. But I am aware that there was a very famous movie by that title, and that's what this passage reminded me of. Uh, I'm not really much of a rom-com guy. My wife would tell you I could use a little more rom and a little less com, to tell you the truth. But anyway, this is the story like of when Solly met Sammy. This is how the man who would be king, Saul, met Samuel, the man who would bestow that on someone. It's just the first half of this is just the story of those two coming together. It starts with the story kind of 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 Saul's family line and kind of where he comes from. Uh, He's a Benjamite. The names uh, really don't mean uh, much of anything to us, but we are told that he's from a very prominent family, mighty men of valor. It just means he's from a prominent Benjamite family. But that's not all Saul has going for him. We can tell that his family is well off because of the number of donkeys and servants and oxen. We'll see those later. So he is... uh, He's from the right family, and he's rich, but he's also, we're told, the tallest dude in Israel. Saul is the only guy in the whole Bible, the only Israelite in the whole Bible, who is pointed out for being tall. Take that for what it's worth. But he's not just tall and from a great family and, or a prominent family and rich, and he's also like the most handsome man in all of Israel. We're shown a picture of like the ideal guy. Um, it's, it's not in here, but Saul won the Mr. Israel pageant in 1060 BC. And I just made that up, but I thought it would add a little something 
to the, to the story. But that's the kind of guy he is. He's the ideal. He looks like he's got everything going for him. But then the story of how the supermodel Saul meets the prophet Samuel just starts like this. So one time Saul's dad lost his donkeys. And he sends Saul and what we would call one of the hired men to go look for the donkeys. And so these two take off and they go to this place and the donkeys just keep staying one step ahead of them. They must have asked countless people, have you seen a group of lost donkeys? Right? And they just, they keep chasing, they keep tracking. Uh, they go to this place, they go to that place. The donkeys just always give them the slip, stay one step ahead of them. In verse 5, they reach the land of Zuf. Now you'd be, have to be pretty perceptive to catch it this clue but this is a clue they're getting close to Samuel if you would look back in the first verse of this book remember Samuel the prophet was adopted in the first verse of the book Zuf is Samuel the prophet's biological granddad so they're chasing these donkeys and they wind up on great granddad Zuf's land who's presumably dead by now so they're getting close to Samuel, who lives in Ramah, near the land of Zuf. But Saul's had enough. Seems like they've traveled a lot. We know they're out of food, because he says we're out of bread. We're out of food. So Saul wants to quit and go home. In verse 6, though, the, the, the servant that is with him says, hey, there's a, there's a prophet in this town, and a good one. Nothing this guy says ever winds up being wrong. Maybe we should ask him to help us find the donkeys. Saul is hesitant. He says, I don't know. We don't, we don't have anything to pay the guy with. We shouldn't show up empty-handed. The servant says, I've got a, a quarter shekel of silver here. Come on, I'm buying. Let's go see the prophet. Saul says, all right, let's go. As they approach the city, they need to stop and ask directions. They see some young women headed out to the town well, um, and they decide to ask them. Now, normally in ancient Israel, young women uh, would, not, would not talk to a strange man, especially in a, in a public place. But, you know, he is the tallest and most handsomest man in the entire country. So they seem to make an exception just this once. And he says, hey, we're looking, for, we're looking for the prophet. And they say, oh, you're, you better hurry. I mean, he's, he's right in town. You head in town. He, he must be right there in the center of this probably little village. He's, but he's about to head up into the hills. If you, if you don't get in there and catch him before he goes up there, you'll probably miss him. There's supposed to be a sacrifice today. Now, I'll pause for one second, just in case, especially if you're in my Sunday school class. Uh, if you have questions about Samuel going up into the high places to worship, because almost always in the Old Testament that means idolatry. But it doesn't here. Remember, the, the Philistines destroyed the tabernacle, and the, the Ark of the Covenant's kept in some guy's shop now, because every time the Israelites try to use it, God starts killing folks. So, there's no, there's no ordained, prescribed place of worship. And so we were told in chapter 7 that, that Samuel made his own in a high place. And God seems to be, to be okay with that. So as the two men continue along, they, they walk to, uh, to Ramah. We know this is where Samuel is for. And they, they happen upon someone they think is a stranger. Skip to verse 18. We're going to skip a little chunk there. In verse 18, they happen upon this man looks like a stranger. Saul asks this stranger for directions. Hey, I'm looking for the prophet. And Samuel says, you got your man. I'm the seer. And then Samuel tells Saul, I'm getting ready to go up to a banquet. And you're invited. Please come along. And that's the story of when Solly met Sammy. That's how it happened. All of those coincidences stack on top of one another. The donkeys just happened to get lost. 
They just happened to head toward where Samuel lived. They just happened to stay one step ahead of Saul and the hired man. The hired man just happened to suggest that we go see uh, the, uh, the prophet. He just happened to have enough money to convince Saul that would be okay. They just happened to find these young ladies who were willing to talk to him at just the right time before Samuel disappears. They just happened to bump right into him. And that is how Saul met Sammy. Now let's back up and look at that little flashback. It's verses 15 through 17. Because there we learn this whole thing, that string of coincidences, haven't been coincidences at all. We read now, the day before Saul got there, the Lord talked to Samuel and told him, at this time tomorrow, Samuel, I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin. That's the one you should consecrate prince or commander or leader. It's something less than king. More on that in a minute. He's going to save my people from the Philistines. And then when Samuel, when Saul walks into town, God tells him that's the dude. So God told Samuel to expect Saul, but it's more than that. Look at what he says right here. The Lord told Samuel at this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. All of those seeming coincidences that started with Saul just thought he was having a bad day on the farm, right? Oh, the stupid donkeys, right? All of that was God sending Saul to Samuel just as sure as if he'd shipped him UPS or something. That's God's providence. That's what we call God's providence. God's providence is how God works to get amazing things done when we can't tell God's doing anything at all, right? Saul just thought the donkeys got out again. That's how Israel is going to get its first king. Now, this is like halftime of the passage. And I want to pause our halftime show. will be you and I. We're going to consider the first impressions that we've been given of this man who will be Israel's first king. They've asked for a king. That's who he is. You never get a second chance to make a a first impression, right? First impressions are really important in the Bible. In Hebrew narrative, the first thing you glimpse you get from someone is usually significant and important. So what are our first impressions of Saul just from what we've seen so far. I thought of three things. First, we're given the impression that Paul, Saul, excuse me, Saul is a poor shepherd. Now, I don't want to blame him for letting the donkeys get out. That's not what I'm saying. That may not be his fault. But were these just random things that happened or was God in control of these things? Was God causing these things? God could have gotten Saul to Samuel by any means he wanted, and God chose a picture of poor shepherding. I think we're supposed to file that away. Second, we get a picture of of Saul being rather uninterested in the things of God and spiritual matters. They get stuck Saul's ready to quit and go home. If he didn't have his hired man with him, he wouldn't even have thought to pray, to go, certainly to go see this prophet. You know what? Something else, during this time period in Israel's history, Samuel is without a doubt the most famous person in the entire nation. And Saul doesn't seem to even know who he is, doesn't know he exists. He seems to have no spiritual interest. And when he has a real problem in his life, the donkey herd is gone. Dad sent me to find him and I'm going to fail. He doesn't seem to have any, any need or inkling. Maybe I should ask the Lord to help me. 
So we got a, a poor shepherd who doesn't feel the need to get his guidance from God. But boy, he sure is handsome and tall. Which makes me feel like Israel has gotten its wish. They're getting a king like all the other nations. Not that great of a leader. Uninterested in the things of God. But look the part. Tall and handsome aren't you know, great things, great platforms to build a campaign on, are they? Well, consider this from my days teaching American history. When's the last time or how many times have Americans elected someone to be president who was short? Who is under average height? You know how many times it's happened in the last 200 years? Once. Jimmy Carter was less than average height. How about this? When's the last time Americans elected a bald man to be president? That's why I'm out. Right. You know how many times? Last, since Martin Van Buren in 1836 or something like that, Dwight Eisenhower is the only bald man we've ever elected. And he was maybe the greatest war hero in the history of our nation, which seems to be enough to compensate, I would guess. When's the last time we elected a man to be president who wore glasses full time? Think about it. Got to go to Woodrow Wilson, 1912. Now, is that because there aren't any short, bald, bespectacled men who are capable or is it because we're shallow? Why, you know, if you look back at, President, at the pictures of President Biden, he started to get a little thin up here. And apparently, like what made him go get the whatever he had done up there, the full, he got the full meal deal up there, the full, he got the works package, right? The plugs or whatever it is. You know, President Trump, what made him hang on to all that stuff and flow it up there just right, you know? Is it because they're so shallow that they have to have that? Or is it because they know we are? We still want somebody that looks the part. And we don't care nearly enough whether they're actually interested in seeking guidance from where they should. So anyway, we better get back to our story. That's, our, that's my first impressions or our first impressions were left of the man who would be king Saul. Well, they've met and now Samuel invites Saul to this banquet that's already been prepared and much to Saul's surprise, he's the guest of honor. They, they go up to the hill they go up the hill and we've been waiting on you and Saul gets literally the stuff reserved for royalty. He gets the special place at the table and the special food and it's all for you. And Samuel tells Saul, Saul, do you know what the whole nation of Israel has been desiring? You. And he tries to protest he says, this doesn't carry much weight with us probably, but he says, you know where I'm from, right? I'm a Benjamite. This is the time period of the judges still. The very tail end, but it's the time period of the judges. Long story for a different Sunday, but toward the end of the book of Judges, there's this really awful story about this really awful group of people who do a really awful thing and the rest of the nation wants to kind of wipe them out. Yeah, guess who that is? The tribe of Benjamin and the people from right where Saul lives. When Saul says, I'm like, we're, my family's like the least of the least tribe, it's not financially and certainly not height. He's basically saying, like, even I understand, I'm from poor moral stock. And he's not wrong. But the banquet continues, Saul's the guest of honors, honor, and the next morning Samuel sends Saul on his way. But before he does, the prophet Samuel makes sure Saul 
understands three things before he leaves. And so this is the end of chapter 9 through the, in the first eight verses of chapter 10. First, Samuel makes sure that Saul understands you are definitely God's choice to be king. He's going to give the people what they've asked for. You are what they've asked for. Saul makes that clear. Excuse me. Samuel makes that clear by sends the servant away. See, nobody knows what's happening except for Saul and Samuel. He takes a flask of oil and he anoints. He just dumps probably olive oil over the head of Saul and kisses him. Uh, before this in the Bible, the only things that have been anointed with oil are stuff that's supposed to go in the tabernacle to be used for God's service, like the furniture and the altar and stuff like that, and priests who were set apart to work for God in the tabernacle. And now Saul gets anointed because now he's set apart by God. So you're definitely the king. Now, if you were Saul, would this be hard for you to believe? Like, I was just out here chasing some donkeys around. That's all I was doing. And you're telling me, like, he wasn't campaigning. He had no idea. He didn't even know Samuel existed. And now he's being told he's the first ever king of the whole nation. I wouldn't buy it. Would you? How's God and how's Samuel supposed to convince Saul that this is legit? That's this list of signs. God in his grace through Samuel tells Saul, Saul, on your way home, God's going to continue to organize the events of the world like he always does. Only this time, he's going to tell you what they are before they happen. And there's three little scenes that are signs to convince Saul. And I want you to notice something. We're not going to fine-tooth comb these things. But when God gives Saul a sign, it's, the level of detail is really incredible, especially for Hebrew narrative. Hebrew storytelling doesn't have a lot of details. We have to fill in a lot of the details, like in our mind's eyes. But these things are incredibly detailed. It's not like a horoscope or a fortune cookie or some, some of that gobbledygook that maybe can be happening and maybe isn't like, you will sense opportunity today. And it's like, oh, what's, oh maybe I'm feeling that. I don't know, right? I don't know. Or there will, the path will straighten beyond an obstacle. Maybe, did that happen? What was the obstacle? I had a little gas this morning, was that? <laughs> right? None of that rot. None of that stuff. Scene one. Samuel tells Saul, when you're on your way home, you're going to go by, uh, right by Rachel's tomb. Now, Rachel is the matriarch of the tribe of Benjamin. So this is a very important landmark. When you get to the very important landmark, uh, you're going to meet two men. And they're going to tell you that your father's donkeys have been found, that your dad is worried about you. And then they will say, and I quote, that your dad has been saying, and I quote, what should I do about my son? You hear all the details in there? Two men. So if you meet four guys, and they say they don't know about the donkeys, then you don't have to believe anything I'm saying. That's scene one. Or if it's not by, uh, if it's not by uh, Rachel's tomb. Scene two. When you get to the Oak of Tabor, another landmark apparently. You're going to meet three men, right? Not two, not four. You're going to meet three men. And one of them is going to have three young goats. One's going to have three round loaves of bread. And another, the other one's going to have a container of wine. You hear all those details? Like either that stuff happens like that or it doesn't. In other words, if, like if Saul meets like four guys with two sheep, a jug of wine, and a box of Pop-Tarts, that's not close enough, right? You can forget this whole thing. Samuel also says, they're going to give you some of the bread. That's significant, because these guys are going to worship. 
So they've got the ingredients of a sacrifice. Three goats, three loaves of bread, and a jug of wine. And all that stuff is supposed to belong to God. And Samuel says, they're going to give you some of God's bread, and you should take it. Because you're God's dude. Scene three, finally, Samuel tells Saul, when you get really close to home, you're going to meet some, some prophets who have been worshiping God. And as they come down, they're going to be telling people what God has said. That's prophesying. And Samuel says, Saul, the Spirit of God is going to fall on you. You're going to start to hear God. And you're going to start proclaiming what God says. And you're not even going to be able to control this. Now, if all that happens exactly like that, you think Saul has enough evidence to believe Samuel? What else can you do? He's got plenty of rock-solid evidence. I guess I'm the king. Or I guess I'm going to be. But then before Saul leaves, Samuel wants him to hear one more thing. That's number three right here. The hierarchy for Saul's reign as king should be like this. God, then Samuel, and then King Saul. And here's how he tells him this. In verse 8 of chapter 10, Saul says, After you get home, after all that stuff happens, and you will be convinced you're the king, then go down ahead of me to a place called Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you, and I'll offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait and here's the important part, until I come and I show you what you're supposed to do. Now in the ancient world, how many people got to tell the king what he was supposed to do? No, but this is a different kingship. This is why I tried to point out, if you read through these chapters around here, Samuel and God, it's like they have a hard time calling Saul king. It gets translated like prince or leader or something like that because he's different. God is supposed to be the sovereign of Israel. And in this day, how is Israel supposed to find out what God wants? God speaks through Samuel. And so that's why the hierarchy is supposed to be God's the sovereign Saul, you work for God, and if you're going to hear directly from God, you're going to have to listen to Samuel. So Saul leaves, he goes home, we're, not, we're spared the details of the first two scenes, we're just told they happened. The third scene though, as Saul gets really close to home, the Spirit of God rushes on him, here come those other prophets with the specific instruments they were supposed to have. Um, and Saul prophesies. He hears from God and he starts proclaiming God. And so he has enough evidence to believe he's the king, right? But there's some other people around. And these other people start to say derogatory things about Saul. Oh, they can tell it's Saul. How do they know it's Saul? He's close to home. He's the tallest guy in the country, right? He sticks out in a crowd. Does Saul seem to have everything going for him? He's tall. He's rich. He's handsome. He's not very good at finding donkeys, but that's not a big deal, right? They start saying, oh, so Saul's a prophet now. Sure. So, oh, is Saul among the prophets? He's that too? Sure thing. It's all derogatory. And Saul finally gets home. Sees his family, sees his uncle. Saul, you're alive, man. What happened? Oh, man, we went to look for the donkeys. We asked Samuel. We talked to Samuel. You saw Samuel? Tell me everything. And Saul says, Samuel told us that the donkeys were found the end. Did he leave any details out of the story? He doesn't tell him this little bit about, oh, yeah, and I'm the first king of Israel. And we're not given any judgment here. In other words, we're not told this was wrong. Nobody knows except Samuel and Saul 
we don't have to tell everyone everything, right? But does it seem like there's something off with this guy? I think that's another, that's just the impression we are left with. Did he have all of the information he needed to believe he was God's choice to be the king of the nation? You can't get more evidence than he got. But if, but if some people start making fun of him, and before long, he just, it just sucks the confidence out of him. And he keeps it to himself. That's the story of when Saul met Sammy. And I think, even though it's kind of a bizarre story that happened 3,000 years ago, it is designed and preserved to teach us three things. First, this is just a good reminder, God still works providentially through His providence. When we can't tell that God is active, that does not mean God is not active. We live in the chapter 9 version of God's providence, not the chapter 10 version. In other words, we're just chasing donkeys around. God doesn't tell us ahead of time what's going to happen. We don't get the signs. We just have to trust that God is active and doing His thing. We just have to, like we used to say a long time ago around here, we just have to stay in the boat with Jesus. There's no place better to be. Second, this passage reminds us that Saul's hierarchy that he is given should be ours. Right? Saul was supposed to, God's supposed to be the sovereign. Samuel was supposed to come next. Saul was supposed to be under that. That's still supposed to be our hierarchy. God is to be our sovereign. Jesus Christ is to be our king. And this is where we hear what God says to us now. These are our marching orders And finally, I think we're reminded here that, that naysayers should never knock the confidence out of the people of God. This is what happens to Saul at the end, right? How many of you have ever thought, oh, if God would just prove it to me, if you're a real God, do this or that, and then I'll really believe. Saul gets that. And he just has to hear about three people go, oh, you're all holier than now, now. Oh, are you really churchy? Mr. Christian guy over there. And then Saul's like, okay, never mind. Listen, our sovereign has appointed us with all kinds of stuff we are supposed to do. We're not king of anything. But he has told us in his word what our marching orders are. He has told us what we need to know of what is best and you know, everybody else that doesn't get in the boat with Jesus, they can row their own boat their own way and God help them. But we shouldn't let those who refuse to be in the boat convince us to get out, right? I think that was a lot of Saul's problem and it should never be ours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for really old stories of how you have dealt in the world. God, you, your sovereignty and your providence is still the way you work in this world. You, your sovereignty is still real. You're still at work. And God, our, our calling is to stay in the boat with Jesus and invite others to be in here with us. So God, help us to encourage one another to stay in the boat with Jesus. Keep rowing in the direction your word tells us to row and not to lose our confidence uh, when the people around us either think we're foolish for making you the direction of our lives or uh, to try to mock uh, you or us. God, help us get our, our acceptance needs from our, our Father in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and God, thank you uh, that you still are at work in this world. We love you, um, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Which will be really confusing for those of you who don't farm. <laughs> but God will still be at work. Our job, 
Stay in the boat with Jesus. Don't let the naysayers convince us to get off track. We have a sovereign. He's given us our marching orders. And there's no place better for us to be than heading in that direction to His glory. Amen? All right, if you would love to pack a shoebox or sing in a choir or decorate for church, stick around or eat pizza and pretend you're doing some of those. (laughs) Stick around. Love you guys. See you next week.